Hello everyone, this is me Rabab Zehra. Welcome to TechX Media. I have with me Juwan Lee, who is a chairman and group CEO of NextChange Group, one of Asia's prominent digital merchant banks concentrating on blockchain, fintech, health tech, AI, and smart cities. In addition, NextChange Group is co-hosting Gulf Blockchain Week, which will take place next month. So we contacted Juwan to chat with him about the event before it starts, as well as to discuss the Middle Eastern market for blockchain and much more. So without uh, further ado let's ex let us extend a warm welcome to joan hi joan how are you i'm doing well thank you for having me okay so i have a couple of questions for you i will start with obviously gulf blockchain week uh, which will be co-hosted by an exchange group and it's going to take place uh, next month what does this event mean and what should we expect from it well next change group together with our partners evolution group and EchoX are co-hosting Gulf Blockchain Week from the 8th to the 15th of October with the main event taking place on the 11th and 12th. What this event means is that it will be highlighting the culmination of the development of the Gulf as a hub for the blockchain ecosystem. Long-term strategic plan has been in, uh, put into place and this event will showcase and debate important topics such as crypto regulation, investment landscape, supply chain management, blockchain use cases, to just to name a few. The Gulf, particularly Dubai, has been the main beneficiary for many uh, and is on its way to be uh, positioned very well after the pandemic or during the pandemic. Most importantly, it allows innovative companies to get the message out to the public. You never know what kind of company will be presenting that one day may become a unicorn from these type of events? Well, well, that's that's interesting. Uh, so can you please share some insights on the blockchain ecosystem in Dubai and Middle East and North Africa region? So the Gulf region uh, consists of a set of countries that border the Arabian Gulf and has about 100 million people. The area has developed rather quickly in terms of business technology opportunities where the current infrastructure has interacted to create new innovative companies. Add to this the local natural entrepreneurial talent, interest in technology applications, high demand for new investment vehicles and regulatory certainty. And you kind of get a flavor of what the Gulf and the MENA region uh, blockchain ecosystem looks like. One of the most important components here are very progressive regulation activities, which over the last four or five years has positioned UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia as a forward thinking and technology friendly uh, in environment. For example, Abu Dhabi was the first in the region to introduce comprehensive virtual asset regulation. Yeah. Bahrain Central Bank provided supportive rules relevant to companies operating with crypto assets and even has now licensed two crypto exchanges. And Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority is one of the first central banks in the Gulf region to experiment with blockchain technology for government money transfers. Okay, now, so when it comes to regulatory bar barriers, what are the regulatory barriers for blockchain initiatives in the region and how can we overcome them? You know, I've been asked this many times and the conclusion I always come up with this is, uh, is that one of the biggest barriers in regulatory uh, environment is always that the company needs to know how to work and challenge the regulators. It's about asking the right questions and implement viable products in the market. And one of the best solutions is creating sandboxes. So for example, sandbox support the strongest entrepreneurs from across the ecosystem. They can shake up the existing financial system as well. So for example, in Oman, the central bank launched its FinTech regulatory sandbox, as well as Dubai Financial Services Authority partnered with the UAE C4IR to kick off a blockchain sandbox. For the sake of market growth, 
it gives a pathway for more blockchain startups and digital asset companies to succeed. Cool. That's very, very uh, interesting to know. Uh, so now moving forward about NFTs, people have spent around uh, $237 million on NFTs since 2018. And with the great bulk of that money spent after the trend skyrocketed in January 2021. In light of this, where is the NFT market heading now? We had a very interesting 2021. It started off with a tremendous amount of acceleration, especially the first half. Hmm. And then we saw a sharp decline, I would guess mostly due to the accelerated pricing for gas prices on Ethereum. For those who are not aware, in order to do a transaction, you need to be on Ethereum mostly with NFTs. Therefore, you know, the price became prohibitive. And, but what we're seeing now is a strong re a resurgence in the second half of this year. So there are some interesting, you know, uh, I guess, uh, trends that are taking place. The NFT world has gone crazy with things like Bored Ape Yacht Club. And it's really interesting, which is a series of NFTs depicting apes, bored ones, with various uh, facial expressions. And they're selling for like $2.25 million US dollars worth of ETH. So you're seeing a very different kind of uh, acceleration based on different uh, new uh, examples. And, the, and the, the most important thing about this is that it's all about community. Apes and other collections feel like, you know, they're a part of a membership club. And that's what second, you know, that's also, that's driving, you know, one of the big uh, second waves of the NFT buying right now. Also, we're seeing the big brands, some of them come in. They are doing something very different than what they did before. They're buying existing NFTs rather than making their own. So brands like Visa are adding to its collection as historic commerce artifacts. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing trends like fractionalized NFTs, breaking up its ownership into multiple cheaper parts so that can be bought by the ones that are less well off. But fractionalizing NFT comes with a challenge because that kind of fractionalization may have some regulatory um, implications. But in the end, you know, NFTs is about, you know, we, there's a subculture in, in the gaming world. And we're seeing that there are prominent companies that are being developed and successful games that are using the NFT as more of a uh, part of a game where you can purchase or you, you use uh, NFTs inside the game to progress in the game. So this is a very important part of the next trend. But, and, and, and I think what is the most interesting part that I see also developing is that blockchain can not only host tokens representing a deed of ownership, but for a piece of art to actually create the art work itself. That is called generative art. We believe this is the future where the generative art market, which, you know, with a script or some form of algorithm stored on a blockchain produces original one of a kind artwork during the minting process. And there are several new players that are coming into the market for that. Okay, um, so last question for today's session is about decentralized finance. It was one of the hottest new cryptocurrency concepts in 2020. How has it changed in a year and what have been the most recent trends and developments? Well, you're right. In 2020, uh, DeFi came with a storm. It accelerated significantly. And what happened was, you know, the, the way you... Uh, Calculate is based on total value locked. It's a measure of DeFi transaction volume. And it grew 14x in 2020 and is already more than tripled in 2021. So it's still growing rapidly. What we see is that traditional financial products are now entering the DeFi landscape. So for example, if you look at the financial derivatives in the traditional market, it dwarfs the regular financial markets. DeFi derivatives currently 
on the other hand, is still in its infancy. And the total value unlocked um, or locked is, is in DeFi is currently, a, 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 only represents about 7% of total DeFi. We believe that is going to be growing very rapidly. And since last year, this growth has gone, uh, gone up by 200X. An example of this kind of uh, growth comes from one of the bigger players, which is uh, Synthetix, and is by far the largest player in the market. And they create what we call synths, synths, which are basically, it mimics the price action of whatever an asset or commodity does that they track, like gold, oil, US dollar, or Bitcoin. The other thing that I think is interesting is DeFi is monetizing blockchain gaming. So, you know, there's over 2 billion gamers in the world. Basically, video games are run on blockchain, not on, on central servers. So the, the, the players mine coins to do certain tasks in a game. And uh, popular DeFi protocols will be needed to, you know, to allow for this kind of game transferability. As we grow, there's a lot of complication from chain to chain. And cross-chain technology is really one of the more important things as uh, DeFi grows in its ecosystem and the transaction costs are increasing. So, uh, you know, Ethereum gas price has gone up so much this year that alternative uh, chains have been looked at. So we would have to go cross-chain in order to allow this to happen. And, you know, one of the uh, solutions of this is through interoperability will be able to go cross chain from one chain to another. And Polkadot is one of the networks that has been most popular in terms of being able to convince to the market that a cross chain solution is in place. And finally, I think is important here is that when, when we saw the last cycle, DEX or, or decentralized exchanges were very much an e-liquid and not a viable solution. But in this cycle, we are starting to see decentralization and decentralized exchanges become a very important part of the overall exchange market. Um, but what we have to do is look at balancing decentralization with efficiency. So like if you look at a centralized exchange like Coinbase, you know, it allows for efficient transaction, but it's really not decentralized. And, but, and it is a public company and they're lacking when it comes to to this type of decentralization. So for on DAX, certain you know, crypto owners transact directly with each other and there's no need to go through an intermediary. And what we've seen examples is like Uniswap is now the largest DAX in the space and Uniswap and it's uh, the second largest exchange currently represent over 60% of the trading volume for all DAXs. So we're starting to see that you know a, a a idea that was not really uh executable in the last cycle now become one of the most significant part of this particular uh up cycle and be a part of a uh, ecosystem that's ever growing great that's a very very interesting joanna i must say and wish you luck for the Gulf Blockchain Week happening next month. Next month, um, I would like to wrap up the interview here with um, with great appreciation from our side for um, uh, for being here with us for this interview. And we look forward to have a conversation with you again after the Gulf Blockchain Week next month. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Goodbye, everyone, and stay tuned to TechX for more updates about what is happening inside the technology industry.